So welcome everyone to today's seminar. It's a pleasure to introduce Annelise in our today. Uh, Annelise uh, is currently a Juan de la Sierra Fellow at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canaria in Tenerife uh, in Spain. Uh, she was an undergrad uh, student, a master's student here uh, at uh, Urbis. And uh, in 2015, she moved to France to do her PhD at uh, the Observatoire de Paris. And uh, her thesis title was the multi-wavelength analysis of nearby active galaxies, probing the aging feeding in FIBA. Uh, she uses ALMA high resolution obser observations of a sample of nearby AGN as part of the, of the NUGA collaboration. Then she moved on, moved on to Athens uh, in Greece, uh, where she did her first postdoc and started uh, working uh, on the evolution of uh, the molecular gas content uh, in radio galaxies. So uh, thank you very much, Annie, for uh, accepting our invitation. Uh, you may start when you're ready. The floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Anna, for the invitation. For me, it's a great pleasure to give this uh, uh, talk today, uh, especially because Woods is the place where everything started. So all my career started there. So for me, it has a lot of meaning uh, to speak with, uh, for you today. So today I'm going to talk about the KSO Feed project that is a multi-wavelength view of AGN feedback impact on the central kiloparts of a galaxies. This project is mainly de developed here in the uh, uh, IAC at uh, Canary Islands, the beautiful island of Tenerife, but it's also done in collaboration with many uh, international uh, researchers uh, all over the world. So uh, oops. to start, uh, let me just uh, briefly introduce uh, AGN feedback. So. It's now believed that AGN is like a, a short active phase of a life of a galaxy that it can last from scales of as short as 0.1 mega years up to 100 mega years. And it's believed that nowadays uh, every galaxy or most of the galaxies will go through an active phase in their lives or even uh, several AGN episodes according to the gas supply that is um, uh, going to the center of the galaxy and triggering the supermassive black hole. So this gas supply depends on several effects on how to trigger the agent, for example, secular processes or mergers, uh, interactions. Uh, and once the supermassive uh, black hole is a critical matter and is active, uh, is known that it's going to launch outflows. And nowadays we believe that outflows are ubiquitous, at least in the most luminous uh, AGN. These outflows are manifested through different scales. So here I show this review by uh, Claudia Ciccone in 2018, where uh, she showed the different scales have, uh, that we can measure outflows. For example, at less than one parsec scales in the accretion disk, where we can see this launch of uh, broad absorption lines outflows or uh, ultra-fast outflows, mostly traced in the X-rays or the UV. And then if we move to pars, uh, more than parsecs at two kiloparsec scales, where the outflows are uh, acting in the instellar, interstellar medium of the galaxy and uh, therefore affecting the gas content and the star formation of the galaxies. And also AGN feedback is also manifested through these very large scales of more than 10 kiloparsec scales that is happening in galaxy clusters through these uh, uh, huge radio uh, jets, the lobes of radio jets. But we also observe uh, these uh, outflows in several uh, uh, phases. So outflows are tracing different, different phases from neutral, uh, ionized and uh, molecular atomic gas. So if one wants to probe the uh, impact of the current AGN phase of the galaxy, we have to look at uh, spatial scales that are corresponding to the time scales of the current uh, AGN uh, episode. So if one wants to trace the, the scales, outflow scales of 10 mega years, for, for example, we have to look at the spatial scales corresponding to the central kiloparsecs of galaxies. 
So we can mainly dis distinguish two main modes of um, uh, AGN feedback, the quasar mode, that is also uh, known as the wind uh, mode, that is uh, happening through radiative process or winds launch at the accretion uh, disks. These are observed mostly in high uh, luminosity, uh, AGN luminosities, accreting close to the agent tone uh, ratios and are manifested mostly in high Z and young uh, uh, quasars. On the other hand, we have the radio mode feedback that is also known as the kinetic mode. And this is uh, happening through the emission of collimated radio jets. It's observed mainly in low luminosity agents at low Z and massive galaxies. So here I show an example of uh, this uh, source observed by McNa McNamara that shows the radio, the huge radio uh, lobes extending and preventing the, the, the cooling flows in this uh, gal central galaxy cluster. Uh, radio mode feedback, this is the topic that I'm going to focus more in this talk, is believed to be a crucial element on the regulation of gas accretion activity in stellar matter assembly. So by doing, uh, by depositing uh, a lot of kinetic energy from the relativistic jets, this uh, uh, this feed, this main uh, mode of feedback uh, prevents the overgrowth of uh, massive galaxies. So without this, galaxies would be too big, and th therefore it's, it's, it's successfully explained this bright end of uh, the galaxy luminosity function. So this is the recipe that we introduce in the cos cosmological models uh, to explain the, the large scale, the scales happening at the, at the galaxy clusters and these uh, large scale radio jets preventing the, the cooling flows. But what I wanted to talk today is to highlight the importance of radio mode feedback in galactic scales. So we know that hydrodynamic simulations of relativistic jets can couple into uh, inhomogeneous and clumpy uh, uh, ISM. And as long as the jet is going to uh, percolate this gas, this uh, clumpy ISM is going to create a bubble that is going to uh, expand and shock the material and promote uh, multiphase outflows. So this I show here I show um, a simulation uh, for different snapshots of Wagner uh, 2012, and you can see that uh, as long as um, the radio jet is uh, expanding, it's going to create this uh, huge cocoon of shock material. And one result from this uh, hydrodynamic simulations is that feedback depends on the kinetic energy uh, that is able to unbind the, the galaxy potential and also the distribution of this uh, surrounding medium. Uh, another uh, important uh, aspect is that strong feedback can occur even in the case of low power jets. So it is intuitive to think that most more radio power, more powerful uh, radio jets will be able to produce more damage in the galaxy, but actually the simulation so shows the opposite. So, here uh, we have uh, on the left panel uh, the initial gas uh, density uh, and then simulations for different jet powers in the middle, uh, low jet power and on the right, uh, high jet power of 10 to the 45 eggs per second. And as we can see, the high jet power escapes the galaxy potential in shortest times. Here we have a snapshot for uh, 0.79 mega years and the jet is almost uh, escaping the gal gal galaxy potential. While in the low power jet of power 10 to the 4, we can see that the jet is able to produce more damage because it's going to be trapped into the galaxy potential for longer times. Here, the snapshot is for three mega years and is going to uh, uh, impact a larger volume in, in the galaxy. So in this sense, uh, since the, the jet is finding a hard time to escape, on the way to escape is going to create more uh, multiphase outflows. And one um, important uh, parameter uh, uh, to produce more, a more efficient uh, feedback is also the inclination in respect to the jet and the ISM. So from the observational point of view, we can uh, measure um, mass outflow rates, for example, of outflows. And in this compilation of Fiore, this is an empirical relation. In the y-axis, you have the mass outflow rate and in the x-axis, you have the volumetric luminosity. 
And you can see uh, that uh, for molecular winds that you have here in blue and ionized winds, we can see two things. One is that the, the mass flow rate correlates with the uh, AGN luminosity, bolometric luminosity. This goes with the idea that the uh, AGN wind is pushing away the gas um, and the kinetic energy of the wind corresponds to a fraction of the AGN uh, energy. But also we can see in this plot, there's an offset between the molecular uh, detections and the ionized ones. So we can see that the molecular uh, winds are carrying the bulk of the outflow phase. But one question that arises from this plot, is it only a quasar mode driven because this uh, is only correlating uh, one galaxy property that is the bolometric or the AGN luminosity to try to explain everything. And I will talk uh, later uh, a bit more about this. So uh, I would like to introduce to you the KSO Feed project. That is the project that I'm uh, involved here in the Canary Islands. So this is a effort to assess the impact of quasar driven outflows on galaxy properties with the same dynamical time scale. So that's why I mentioned in the beginning. So we are looking here at um, uh, spatial scales of central kiloparsecs of galaxies, because we know that this corresponds more or less to the active phase uh, of these quasars. So this um, KSO feed is a sample of um, obscure KSOs, so type 2 KSOs, uh, with bolometric luminosities uh, above 10 to the 46. So according to this uh, relation that I show in the previous plot, these are supposed to host very powerful outflows. They are all uh, luminous infrared galaxies with different morphologies and environments. We select uh, objects uh, at redshift around one. So this, uh, in this way, we are able to perform resolves to uh, studies, uh, uh, reaching a, a few uh, hundred of parsec scales in these galaxies. And one thing that is uh, characteristic of the sample is that they are all radio quiet galaxies in the sense that they are not radio loud uh, AGN but they all have a, a radio access. So they are radio quiet, but not radio silent. Say, so they have an access. Um, uh, so if you plot the radio luminosities, again, the far infrared luminosities, they, they lie uh, well above this uh, correlation that is supposed to be the correlation between the radio and the, from star forming uh, regions. So we believe that these galaxies uh, could have jets and winds that can drive uh, ionized and molecular outflows. So the parent sample consisted of a, a catalog of narrow line uh, uh, quasars from Reyes uh, in 2008. And we selected the sample according to these three different criteria. So the very bright uh, objects in the O3 luminosities, redshifts less than 0.14 in order to perform resolved studies. And also we had the cut in stellar masses to select the, the, the massive objects. So in the end, we end up with 48 uh, type two quasars in the KSO feed sample. And this is a number that allows us to perform some kind of significant statistical uh, studies. Uh, the KSO feed team is uh, shown here in this uh, picture. And also if you want to know more about it, you can check in this website. And the team consists in Cristina Ramos Almeida, this is the team leader. Uh, Patricia Bessier, that is another postdoc in our group, as long as um, Donahi Sparsa Redondo, another postdoc. Giovanna Esperanza is an uh, Italian student, PhD student, that is, she's about to finish another PhD and she's looking for jobs. So if you are interested, please enter in contact either with me or with her. Pedro Enrique Cesar, that uh, she, he was an undergrad student at URCS as well, so now he is part of our team. And Jose Acosta Pulido. So the goal of our team is to characterize AGN feedback in type 2 QSOs using a multi-wavelength approach in order to trace the impact of outflows in the multi-phase gas. So to do this, this is an enormous uh, effort from the observational point of view. We have collected observations from different telescopes all over the world. So we have uh, long slit spectroscopy from um, SDSS from all, for all the sources. Uh, also from uh, the majority of the sources using the GTC uh, EMIR telescope here in the Canary Islands in La Palma. We also have um, IFU observations that this is the, the what the project wants to, to focus on IFU observations 
and with high resolution. So uh, these uh, objects have uh, 12, of, uh, 12 of them observed with Megara, that is in the optical. Uh, 16 KSOs will be observed with the CAC in, in Hawaii. Seven of them were observed with the uh, ALMA in, in Chile. And uh, some of them have observations also with uh, Gemini and Symphony in the near infrared. And now we recently uh, were, um, were awarded time with James, uh, James Webb uh, Space Telescope in cycle two. So we will have uh, five more uh, ob objects observed uh, in the mid infrared. So let me start with the cold molecular gas part. So this is a multi wavelength um, project, but I will start with my phase, favorite phase that is the, the molecular gas. So in this uh, article uh, in, in 2022, led by Christina, that uh, is the group uh, boss, <laughs> she, we observe um, ALMA CO2 to one observations in a sample of seven uh, uh, type two quasars at 0.2 arc second resolution. This roughly corresponds at 400 parsec, galax, uh, parsec in this galaxy set. Uh, so here I show some, uh, some images, uh, composed images of the uh, uh, SDSS to show the different morphologies that uh, the sample has. So we have some uh, interacting, merging, spiral systems, and some uh, early type. The first result from this work is that the early type galaxies were not detected in, in CO. But for the other five, we have, he, I show here in the color code, the CO2 to one intensities, uh, and in contours is the 1.3 uh, millimeter continuum. So we can see that the CO morphologies are quite uh, diverse. So we, al we also see the spiral arms uh, um, in two of them. One is this giant massive blob of highly concentrated gas. And two of them have this kind of double peak morphology. And when we try to compute the masses of this, uh, of this, uh, the molecular masses of these galaxies, we separate them according also to the morphological type. So here in in blue, uh, we have the the interacting systems. In yellow, we have the uh, spiral systems. And in, in, in um, orange, we have the, the early type ones. So we can see that the early types were not detected, so they consist only in uh, upper limits. The, the interacting systems are, have a high uh, uh, cold, uh, cold gas masses, and the spirals also present a very high amount of, uh, of molecular gas. So to compare with samples of uh, inactive galaxies, uh, according to the more morphological time from the cold gas survey, for example. So the, the blue ones are the spirals and the early type in purple, for example. These KSOs have a bit more, uh, the ones that were detected show uh, higher values of, uh, of molecular uh, masses. And these will be in between of uh, main sequence galaxies and uh, ULIX, for example, that would lie for example, here in the top right part of the, the plot. So we believe that this um, uh, different kind of uh, 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 molecular masses detected uh, depend also in the depletion in the morphology and radio power of these uh, galaxies. And as I mentioned before, these are very uh, uh, high luminosity uh, AGNs. And we were expecting to detect very uh, broad outflows, very fast outflows in the molecular gas. So according to this uh, empirical relation, we would see these quasars lying down here at the top uh, of this, re this relation. But when we were looking at the data, we didn't see these powerful outflows. Actually, they, sh they show velocities that are quite mild. We were expecting to detect these broad wings and we had to kind of perform a, 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 a modeling to try to uh, derive in a consistent way the velocities and the mass outflow rates. And these quasars that we detect uh, molecular outflows, they lie well below the empirical relations observed by Fiore. So 
they sh they share properties intermediate between uh, Cipher and Eulerx. So we believe that age and luminosity is not the only factor driving these outflows. Maybe there are other elements playing an important role, for example, the jet power or how these winds or jets are coupled with the, the disks. Uh, and in, in this paper, we suggested two scenarios to explain um, the, the efficient of driving outflows in this case. So scenario, scenario A is the strong coupling. So you have the CO disk and the winds or the jets are coplanar, so are able to launch more powerful outflows. Or on the other hand, in scenario B, you have an angle between the two, and then therefore this uh, will lead to a very mild uh, uh, AG, uh, AGN wind. So when we were observing this molecular gas um, uh, from with Alma in, in the Christina's paper, we saw the case of one galaxy that was really interesting, that is the teacup Aegean. So let me introduce, because this is nowadays my favorite uh, object. So teacup, uh, the name stands for this, um, uh, the shape of the large uh, scale uh, spending bubbles in the ionized and the radio uh, observations that resembles the handle of a teacup. Therefore, it, it gets uh, the, the name. So the center also hosts a compact radio jet of uh, kiloparsec scale that uh, is shown here in, in white contours. It's believed that in the center, this radio jet could be the potential driver of a nuclear outflow detected in the ionized guys traced by the O3 line. But also the O3 line uh, is seen to have um, an outflow detected much extended, reaching kilo, uh, 30 kiloparsec scales, observed with news by Venturi uh, recently, like the paper was out last month. And here I present the CO221 uh, and 322 observations. So the 221 were already presented in Christina's paper, and the 322 uh, were available in the archive. So here I show that the CO322 also uh, have this double peak morphology, and we believe that this radio or the agent driven wing is pushing away the gas in, and 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 uh, causing this uh, disturbed morphology. So already in Ramos Almeida 2022, when we were modeling this uh, galaxy, we saw that uh, here is the data of the velocity field, the model, and the residuals. And we see that there's an enhance of residuals along this preferential direction. So I tried to model with Barolo, uh, 3D Barolo, that is a code to allow us to, to, to use the full data cube to, to derive the rotation curves. And when I, we, uh, I was um, modeling this with Barolo, as you can see here in the video for the data and the model, the model fails to reproduce rotation in this galaxy. Uh, actually, Barolo can only reproduce 50% uh, of the flux observed as rotation. All the rest is impossible. And also, the model fails to explain the high velocities, uh, as shown here in some of the channel maps. So. Here, the model is not able to reproduce the, the high velocity ends. So to analyze a bit further the kinematics of this uh, galaxy, we decided to uh, produce pseudo slides, but not the typical way along that are usually along the major and minor axis of the galaxy, but we placed the slices along the jet and perpendicular to it to produce position velocity diagrams. So here are the PV plots. So this is the position and velocity along the jet axis and perpendicular to the jet axis. And as we can see, we can uh, this observation show a very sharp gradient of velocities reaching up to 400 kilometers per second, but not, al not along uh, the jet axis only, but also perpendicular to it. And the rotation can this, uh, that we model with Barolo can reach values up the most of 300 kilometers per second. So we believe that these high velocities are part of an outflow. Uh, do you remember that I showed that the residuals uh, were in, in a preferential di direction? So when we look at the CO2 to 1 uh, velocity dispersion, we also see that the, the, the dispersion is enhanced in this direction perpendicular to the radio jet. So here I show the central CO2 to 1 dispersion 
And this phenomenon is also observed in another gas phases, uh, for example, in the O3 gas in the same object, ICAP, using uh, the GTC Megara observations and also with MUSE, you can see in color code here also an enhancement in this direction that is perpendicular to the compact nu uh, nuclear uh, jet. And this phenomenon of enhanced uh, uh, velocity widths perpendicular to the jets is also observed in some other uh, examples in the literature. For example, in some Cipher uh, galaxies that have ra uh, radio jets, for example, the case of IC5063 uh, uh, by Venturi in 2021. Here in the black, you have the contours and the velocity dispersion is enhanced in this uh, perpendicular direction. Is also observing some other radio galaxies from the Murale survey. So in this sense, uh, this phenomenon of enhancement perpendicular to the jet is not observed um, for the first time, but is the first time that we see it in the molecular gas. And since we had two line uh, line uh, uh, available for uh, to model, we tried to do uh, specially resolve um, line ratio maps because they can help us to get a sense of the gas excitation. So when we plot the, the ratio between the CO3 to 2 uh, and CO2 to 1, we can see that there is also an enhancement in the direction uh, perpendicular to the jet, in the same direction that we see highest uh, velocity dispersion. And these, in, uh, these values uh, are, much, are higher than the typical values found in spiral and disks. And this might be tracing that the gas has different excitation or optical, optical thickness in this region that we believe is the outflow. And is tracing hot, dense gas that probably is excited by the cocoon of shot gas uh, uh, driven by the radio jet. Uh, in the literature, this phenomenon was already reported in the case of IC5063 using also some line ratio, but different than our case in IC53, the highest line ratios or the highest gas excitation were found along the, the radio jet. And in our case, in the TCAP, we find this in this behavior perpendicular to it. So it's the first time in an object that we find clear evidence of enhancement of velocity dispersion and gas excitation perpendicular to the radio jet. So we believe that the radio jet is actually uh, driving this lateral outflow that can carry up to 45% of the CO flux. So here I show only the high velocity in, in orange. Uh, so we believe that the jet, as long as the jet prop uh, propagates into the uh, CO disk, is pushing the gas and driving this very fast outflow. So we derive its outflow mass rates ranging from 15 to 40 uh, solar masses per year, depending on the way, if we are more or less conservative on the way to derive the, the, the rates. And um, one thing that we could derive is the how the jet and the ISM are coupled in this case. We have a jet inclined from a small angle related to the CO disk. This is a, a, a low jet power of 10 to the 43 Hz uh, per second. And one thing that um, I might mention here, the maximum velocities observed for this uh, outflow are much less than escape velocity of this galaxy. So probably this gas eventually will rain back to the galaxy and um, will be part of, of a galactic fountain. So it's playing a role in redistributing the gas and the metals in the galaxies and delaying uh, new star formation. So since we know that jet, uh, the coupling of the jet and the ISM uh, is a uh, strong uh, element for the more feedback in, in, in the case of uh, uh, jet mode feedback, uh, we also saw some agreement with hydrodynamic the simulations from our observations. So the simulations predict strong feedback from low power jets. So we do see it in, in our case. Also, we see a stronger coupling when the jets have low inclination related to the gas disk. So this is the case of Tika. And we also see this shock emission and high velocity dispersions in regions perpendicular to the jet path. So we were saying, OK, we, we are matching all the elements uh, predicted in the simulation. So let's contact the simulator and see what's going on. So we contact uh, Dipanja Murkerji and, and Mao Minakshi. And we run the simulation E of their um, uh, the, their simulations that is for a jet power of 10 to the 45 
and an inclination of 20 uh, degrees between the, the plane of the, C, the molecular plane and the, the, the jet. So here in the left panels, you have the data, the observables, and on the right panels, the predictions from simulations. So as you can see, uh, the simulations are able to reproduce pretty well the observations of uh, the teacup. In the case of the velocity field, uh, here the, the, the black contours trace the, the jet. The velocity dispersion, the simulations are also uh, predicting this behavior perpendicular to it and also the position velocity maps along and perpendicular to the jet axis are able to reproduce velocities up to 400 kilometers per second. So uh, the simulators uh, provide this beautiful image to us. So here you can see the hot tenuous gas that kind of resembles the ionized gas observed with the Hubble, for example, this, uh, the, the two bubbles uh, seen. So this is tracing in temperature. And also in density, uh, we have the, the dense molecular gas disk seen in, in orange and the jet plasma trace in, in white. So we have a remarkable resemblance between the, the simulations and what we observe. And one thing that the simulations provide to us is an explanation why we are seeing this behavior is that as the jet propagates through the to the surrounding medium, to the ISM, is going to get splitted and deflected multiple times. And this uh, splitting is going to make uh, the jet to carry momentum in several directions, including this direction perpendicular to the, the gas plane that is going to accelerate gas out of the disk and drive these uh, outflows. So we are doing some kind of similar analysis for uh, the rest of the sample that have uh, two uh, lines um, to perform the line ratios and uh, maybe use them as a complementary probe for outflows. But so far, we didn't find any uh, evident trend as in the case of TCAP, mainly because the system is uh, mostly well described by rotation. And now we are uh, computing some outflow versus AGN and host uh, galaxy properties. So stay tuned because uh, we are cooking now the paper and will be released soon. So now I'm going to talk about the ionas gas phase. Uh, so this is uh, one case that was a uh, JO945 that was observed with uh, by uh, uh, with uh, Gemini uh, NIFS in the K band. So this work was done by Giovanna Esperanza, the PhD student in our group. So these observations cover a field of view of three uh, arc seconds. This roughly corresponds to seven kiloparsecs in these galaxies uh, from uh, 1.9 to 2.4 uh, microns. And it had an extremely good scene of 0.3 arc seconds. So this is one of the few KSOs that it was studied in the near infrared regime. And when Giovanna performed the analysis of the passing alpha, um, so here she did a, a parametric analysis fitting uh, multiple uh, Gaussian components of the passion alpha line. So she was able to uh, also res uh, uh, produce the resolve maps of the narrow as the, the yellow component here fitted and the, the, the green components that are in the intermediate components. So as you can see here, the narrow component is mainly tracing the rotation in this galaxy. So the velocities are, uh, are small and you have this blue and red shift pattern from rotation. But if you map the intermediate component, there's an excess of negative velocities here in this direction. As if you look uh, a bit better uh, with the full width half maximum, you see that this region corresponds also to have a very large full width of more than 100, uh, a thousand uh, kilometers per second. So this is uh, probably tracing an, an outflow. And if you map only the high velocity components of the nuclear spectrum, here you have uh, the image from minus 300 to, uh, from minus 700 to minus 300 and overlay uh, in black with the radio contours. Uh, so Giovanna computed the outflow properties for this galaxy. So the, this outflow is extending up to a radius of uh, 3.4 kiloparsecs. It has a very uh, high uh, mass outflow rate of 50 uh, solar masses per year. And it seems to be co-spatial with the inner mode past of the, the radio jet. 
So when Giovanna tried to plot in the correlation of Fiore, this agrees uh, pretty much uh, well with the relations in, in, the, in the black points. And in this case, we believe that maybe uh, we have both the action of a quasar and the jet driving this outflow. That's why you are having this very high uh, mass outflow rates in, in J0945. She also looked at uh, the multiphase AGN winds in five QSO2s in the sample that were observed with the GTC Megara uh, here in La Palma, covering a field of view of uh, 20 kiloparsecs. And this, the observations were seeing limit of uh, 1.1 1 .1 arc seconds. And Giovanna was doing uh, analysis of the O3, uh, O3 line, uh, doing uh, parametric and non-parametric analysis. And she found broad components of uh, full width half maximum uh, larger than uh, 1,300 1, kilometers per second blue, uh, that are tracing blue shifted outflows in all the objects in the sample. So here uh, I showed the O3 images of these um, five uh, quasars, and they correspond to the same quasar that were observed with uh, ALMA. So in the bottom panels, you have the ALMA observations. And just to compare, like the ALMA field of view is plotted in magenta uh, for for the for the galaxies just to know that they are tracing different kind of different regions in the galaxy. So Giovanna also comp uh, computed the ionized outflow properties. So she used a robust method to derive the electron densities because uh, one of the problems in deriving the masses from ionized gas is to have accurate measurements of the uh, electron density. So she used uh, uh, the sulfur two lines and also the trans aurora lines. And you can see that uh, this play a major role in deriving the, the masses and the difference can have a factor of a few orders of magnitude. So maybe, uh, these values reported in the literature for these empirical relations should be revised and um, rescaled to use uh, more accurate measurements because these would place uh, all the measurements even below uh, this uh, correlation. So Giovanna points, uh, so here we show this uh, plot again for the Fiori relation and um, the circles represent the molecular uh, detections and the ionized uh, ones are in the squares. And Giovanna points are here, the turquoise uh, uh, colors. So they, they are lying well below the empirical relation from, for ionized outflows here in purple. But also the our points from the molecular gas, the, the, the yellow points, they are lying also well below the, the empirical correlation for the molecular outflows. So one thing that we... Uh, derive is that um, maybe we are not seeing a significant impact on the outflows in the global star formation rates. So one thing that we could do is to go for uh, spatially resolved measurements of uh, recent star formation to see if the outflows that we are detecting, because they have similar uh, time scales of uh, 10 to 10 mega years, to see if they are impacting the, the recent star formation. So this is what we were doing. In Bessier uh, last year, Patricia was uh, another postdoc here in our group. Uh, we detected positive and preventive feedback happening in Markarian 34. So Patricia used uh, tech, uh, CAC um, KCWI uh, observations covering uh, the range of 3,500 3, to 500, 600 angstrom and a field of view of roughly 16 parsecs. And uh, with these observations, uh, we were able to do a spatially resolved uh, analysis of the stellar populations using starlight, but also to uh, map the O3 kinematics using a non-parametric analysis using the W80, the VO2, and the V98 that will trace the broad, the the, the blue shift and red shift uh, sides of the outflow. So here in these uh, panels, I show the results from the resolved stellar population for young that is less than 100 mega years, intermediate and old populations. So you can see that the young population has an increase here in the southeast uh, part. The intermediate population is spread more, of, more, more or less all over. And you have some old population as well in, in, in this direction. 
Uh, regarding the outre kinematics, you can see that the W80 is uh, uh, extended in this direction. Uh, the, the blue shifted and the red shift uh, parts of the outflow are traced by the V V2 and the V98. And when we try to uh, gather all this information together, and therefore here I show uh, the contribution of young stellar population and the contours, we have the red shift part of the outflow and the blue shift part of the outflow. And we can see that the, in the region that uh, is, we have more disrupted gas. So here the turbulence as uh, traced by the W80 is more um, uh, intense, let's say. And also in this side of the galaxy, uh, there, there is more energy being injected in the northwest uh, side. So here the gas is preventing, uh, the outflows is preventing the gas to form new stars. On the other hand, in the blue shifted side of the outflow, we see that as co-spatial more or less with the region that we find um, more um, uh, young stellar population. And the, uh, this, this, the modeling show that this, uh, uh, the population has ages of one to two mega years that are corresponding to the dynamical time scale of this outflow. So in this case, we are having favorable conditions to compress the gas and trigger star formation. So this galaxy shows like a, a very puzzle example that you can have both positive and pre preventive feedback. And it's uh, clear evidence that the um, uh, supermassive black hole winds are directly impacting the star formation at least in one side of the galaxy that have the favored conditions. So this is the goal of the next steps of this uh, KSO feed project, that is to trace the nuclear, the impact of outflows in the, in the nuclear star formation in, in AGN. So to do so, we have uh, awarded four nights at KC, KCWI. So we are going to observe 16 KSO2s. And now uh, this is the new CAC that we're going to cover the blue and the red arms from uh, 3,500 uh, 3, to 10,800 Angstrom. Uh, the PI of these observations was our collaborator, uh, Gabriela Canaliso. We are going to ask for more um, 25 KSOs to be observed. We are still awaiting for the results of this proposal. Uh, so hopefully we'll cover most of the sample uh, with um, very good data, so the best uh, one of the best data data sets to perform both uh, specially resolve uh, uh, stellar population analysis, but also to map the kinematics of the gas. And we have five KSOs uh, that will be observed with James Webb. So these are the same uh, the uh, KSOs that were detected with Alma. And with uh, MRS, we will be able to trace the ionines, the A2, and also the pH uh, features. So this will be a powerful example uh, how to access the multi-phase uh, gas uh, structure. So showing an example here, the case of Marcarin 34, so we can trace the kinematics of the gas, relate them to see how they are affecting the distribution of young uh, uh, stellar populations and also using uh, the, the next step would be to, to use the pHs features as a trace of uh, star formation to see if they can be used as a tracer of star formation. So here is an example of uh, the galaxy NGC 4069 uh, that was um, analyzed by um, Ismael Garcia Bernetti, part of the GATOS collaboration. The GATOS is the Galaxy Activity Torus and Outflow Survey that I'm also part of. And well, uh, is it will be another story to tell, another seminar to give, mm -hmm. uh, to to tell about the GATOS results. So the idea uh, will be to combine all these multiple tracers: the one molecular gas, the ionized tracers, the neutral tracers, the pHs, and have a global view of the of the impact of uh, AGN on the star formation in the central kiloparsecs of galaxies. So just to summarize. Um, uh, starting again with the molecular part, we detected outflows in the five galaxies that uh, were observed, uh, were detected in CO, but they don't show all these 
high velocity broad wings that we were expecting. They actually show mild velocities and mild uh, mass outflow rates, uh, not as is expect was expected uh, by their agent luminosities. One of them show a very particular behavior that is the case of TCAB and is the first time we found the evidence of enhancement of velocity dispersion, but also in gas excitation uh, perpendicular to the, the radio jet. And this is a clear case that the jets are perturbing the kinematics and the physical conditions of the gas in this galaxy. So in JO945, we use um, uh, near infrared observations to trace the ionized uh, outflows. And in this case, we believe uh, that the powerful, the massive uh, outflow that we detect is probably due to the combined the synergy between the quasar and the jet-driven uh, uh, modes. Uh, in another uh, case that we try to uh, analyze the multi-phase um, aspect of the uh, um, of the outflows using uh, megara observations uh, that Giovanna performed, uh, we we show that uh, we need accurate measurements of the de electron density. So maybe all these empirical re scaling relations should be revised and reviewed to perform, uh, to use the best tracers. And maybe we are going to have even like milder um, mass outflow rates in this, uh, in these uh, relations. And in the case of Markarian 34, we could probe the direct impact of supermassive uh, black hole uh, winds in the current, uh, in the recent star formation. Uh, and it shows both positive and pre preventive feedback caught in action. So my takeaway message would be that um, we are, even though that we are not detecting uh, agent feedback as deplenishing all the total molecular gas in these galaxies and quenching the global star formation. We don't see this effect because we are detecting lots of molecular gas, and uh, but we find uh, clear evidence that the agent feedback through radio jets or winds are disturbing the morphology, the kinematics, and the star formation in the central kiloparsecs of this gas reservoirs. So stay tuned because with James Webb and uh, CAC observations, we'll have much more uh, exciting results to show to you. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to answer all the questions. Thank you, Annie. Do we have questions from the audience? And from Zoom, we have Taiz. Well, <laughs> Hey, Annelise, how are you? Hi, Tyson. Ah, podemos falar em português. Sim. Sí. É Tudo bom, Annelise? Tudo bem, contigo, Tyson. Onde tu anda agora? Tu anda em uma palma? Sim. Sí. Não, estou em Tenerife, em Tenerife. Tenerife, você me atrapalha com a Lea Ilha, tá? <risos> tá bem legal os resultados, é um pouco parecido com o que a gente fez, está fazendo com o Bruno até, e com o, o Gabriel Royer um pouco. E, e daí eu tenho uma pergunta, né? Uh, no caso do TCAP, tu deu uma mass outflow rate de 15 a 40 massas solares por ano. Para mim não ficou claro se esse mass outflow rate foi calculado ao longo do jato rádio ou perpendicularmente ao jato rádio. E também assim, porque tem o feedback, eu vejo essa... Nós também já vimos um aumento da dispersão de velocidade perpendicular ao jato ou ao mesmo outflow que a gente vê em gás ionizado, né? E, e isso, claro que dá um feedback, né? mas as pessoas, em geral, não calculam esses mass outflow rates perpendicularmente. Então, eu, eu não ficou claro para mim se esses 15 a 40 massas solares por ano é perpendicular ou é ao longo do jato rádio. Então, aqui a gente considerou diferentes cenários para estimar a, a, a massa em, uhum. em out, que está em outflow. Então, o primeiro cenário, que daria 40 as massas solares por ano, seria o menos conservativo possível. É dizer que tudo que eu não consegui modelar com barolo, ou tudo que, não tá em rota que o barolo não consegue modelar com rotação, está outflowing. Mas esse tá. seria um upper limit. Tá. Usando só... Tanto ao longo como perpendicular? Sim, nesse caso, sim. Mas a gente vê que tem mais resíduos ao longo dessa direção perpendicular. Então, não. outro método que a gente usou foi só usando o fluxo 
que vem da componente de alta velocidade. Usando esse fluxo, que, que seria, que acho que eu mostrei aqui, deixa eu, ah, essa imagem aqui, a imagem do meio. Se eu calcular o fluxo só da componente uh, uh, de velocidades maiores, acima de 300 km por segundo, aí eu tenho uma outflow rate de 20 e pouco. E o mais... Isso, um, é isso é perpendicular ao jato rádio. Isso vai ser, ser perpendicular. Porque as, a componente de altas velocidades está só perpendicular. No Kika. Uhum. Mas as outras galáxias que a gente está analisando no gás molecular não tem esses outflows tão, no, tão visíveis assim. São outflows mais uh, mild, né? moderados. Sim, que, que então esses outflows vocês consideram a parte que não é moderada, modelada pelo barulho, né? Sim. É isso. Depende, porque a gente usa cenários diferentes, métodos diferentes para calcular. Então, um método seria esse, do barulho. O outro método é usando só as componentes de alta velocidade. O outro método, bom, é um método um pouco mais avançado, mais robusto, que daí é um pouco mais conservativo. Uh, conservador? Agora já nem sei mais falar. <risos> Então, depende, depende como a gente estima, porque também na literatura é, é muito degenerado como as pessoas estimam as, essas é. mass outflow rates. E eu acho que aqui nesse plot né, das uh, empirical relations do, do Fiore... Não, onde que está? Quanto da Giovanna? Esse aqui. Se a gente começar a popular esses aqui com as medidas do Adrian Nifs, Provavelmente uhum. também vai sair embaixo, porque eu lembro que vocês também detectam uh, valores muito abaixo Sim. dessas outras galáxias. É, nós temos encontrado isso aí também. É. Mas porque é que essas galáxias são extremamente enviesadas, são galáxias que já sab se sabiam que tinham outflows po potentes, pelo menos em, em gás molecular, essas são as galáxias mais extremas, as galáxias uhum. que são riquíssimas em gás, que tem um monte de starburst, uhum. Então, são galáxias que já se esperava ter, terem outflows. E agora que a gente está começando a observar amostras um pouco menos enviesadas, a gente está começando a popular. Então, tem esses pontinhos cinza aqui, que são da Isabela Lamperti, que também estão mostrando uh, valores uh, da mass outflow rate bem mais abaixo dessa relação. Então, eu acho que a gente tem que começar a popular esse diagrama, porque ele foi... Um, ele foi uh, uh, as pessoas uh, o Fiore desenvolveu isso mas é usado só nos casos mais extremos e isso de repente não é representativo da população de AGN e também o problema desse plot é que as simulações estão tentando reproduzir esses resultados mas esses são os casos extremos e não, não é. estamos mais detectando casos extremos assim, pelo Sim. contrário então, as simulações também estão tentando se ajustar a essas relações empíricas que, na verdade, não são representativas da população de agentes. É, foi bem interessante uma vez. Eu encontrei o Fiore numa conferência no ano passado. E eu disse, puxa vida, eu uso muito a tua relação. Eu disse, pá, todo mundo usa a minha relação. Eu só peguei lá um monte de dados de, de gás molecular e fiz umas contas, assumi uma densidade, assumi um monte de coisa e todo mundo estava usando. Então, Sim, porque é no, ele usou, tipo, por exemplo, a densidade de, uh, do elétron, 200 uh, por centímetro é. cúbico. Então, essa relação aqui, essa linha, é usando... É, mas não é para toda a galáxia, e provavelmente não, o outflow não, vai ter uma tá densidade que diferente. Altas, né? é, claro, que... claro. E daí, Acho que seria legal a gente combinar é. tudo... É. É. E mostrar que esse gráfico, essas relações estão enviesadas e que a gente é. tem muito mais provas né, de, de feedback é. moderados. Né? É. é verdade. É. Ele mesmo disse que não, não era para confiar na relação dele. <risos> Engraçado <risos> quando eu falei com ele. Tá bom, obrigada, Nilice. Bem legal. Obrigada. <risos> mais perguntas daqui? Laura. Laura, desculpa. A minha gente. Uh, desculpa, não entendi a receita. A eficiência. Ah, a eficiência. Sim. Uh, Chega a parte... Parte... Sim, acho que no paper da Giovana 
a gente uh, mostra as eficiências. Com certeza, no paper da Tica, eu comparo a eficiência em relação à kinetic power não? Uh, do, do, do outflow molecular com o, o jet power para ver se o, o jato poderia ser, uh, estar, uh, teria condições ener energéticas suficientes para drive, olha, já não sei mais falar em português, <risos> para lançar esses out outflows. E sim, uh, precisa de uma eficiência baixíssima, não, é, é muito provável que o, o jato possa, possa fazer isso. Então eram eficiências de menos de 1%. Oi, eu uh, só queria fazer uma pergunta assim bem rápida assim, se vocês uh, por acaso pretendem uh, estender esse trabalho para quasar este ponto também, porque eu acho bem uh, bem interessante, eu acho bem, acho bem interessante assim uh, o estudo assim resolvido com a uh, em vários começos de onda assim dos quasares tipo dois assim que revela bastante coisa das estruturas, né? internas deles, e eu queria saber se vocês pretendem fazer isso para tipo um também. Para tipo um complica a nossa vida, porque para fazer a uh, população estelar em tipo um uh, é muito complicado de remover a contribuição do AGN no contínuo, então tu pode estar tá induzindo falsos resultados. Então, por isso que, no momento, a gente está focando só em tipo 2 e tentar... Uh, encontrar o maior significado estatístico, porque por enquanto o projeto começou há poucos anos. Então a gente está começando a extrair informações e objetos individuais, tentando aumentar a amostra, então tipo, nessas análises estão sendo feitas para amostras pequenas e cinco, seis, sete objetos. Então a ideia é tentar tentar extrair o máximo que a gente conseguir usando essa maior parte da, da amostra com observações em a alta resolução angular para fazer essa comparação da como o, os outflows impactam a formação estelar recente. Mas o problema de ir para tipo 1 é que fazer uh, população estelar vai ser muito muito difícil. Então, por enquanto, não. Obrigado. Não. Mais perguntas? Se não, vamos agradecer a Anne de novo. Estava muito legal o seminário. Obrigada, fiquei um pouco nervosa. Imagina. Esperamos da próxima vez te ver aqui. Eu te convidei no Sim. último de dezembro, porque de repente tu ia estar por aqui. Mas... Sim, na próxima, quando eu estiver em próxima Porto Alegre, aqui. eu apareço e dou as caras, né? Tá bom. Abraço. Isso mesmo, Annelise. Vem ver nos visitar. Sim, vou sim. Tchau. Obrigada, gente. Obrigada, foi um prazer. Obrigada. Ah. Tchau. Obrigada. Tchau. Tchau, tchau. Ai, que pena.